Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the day eight of the Transformative Leadership Summit. This is our final day. It's been an no. amazing, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. It has been amazing. Totally awesome. It's been incredible and uh, very, um, just, it's been great. Danny, what are your thoughts? Yeah, same with same as yours. You know, it's it's been great just seeing all the engagement uh, going through, all the content releasing that out. You know, there's been a lot of people active uh, on on Twitter. I think's been the most. Some some on Facebook, Boxer. Uh, you know, the emails that have come in, people thinking it's just it's nice because we've worked hard, right? We're tired, and yes. uh, uh, it's just great to see that the work has an impact. And you hear those success stories and read those things like. That I think is 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 the oxygen for you and me, right, Jethro? Like that gives us uh, hope and it gives us momentum and excitement and satisfaction. So, just thank you for everybody that participated uh, with the Transformative Leadership Summit. Yeah. So the amazing thing is that we have for every day that we've had videos, people have watched about two days worth, forty-eight hours worth of that those videos. So. I think that's pretty amazing um, how much that has happened. And I think that I showed the, uh, the map of where we of yeah. where people were listening early last week. So if I can just pull that up one more time, let me just share my screen here real quick. This is where Duke everybody is. So here's the, Oops. Here's the map of the world. I mean, we got people You're all speaker, over. Oh, sorry, that was mine showing. I thought yours was showing. <laughs> so there we are all over the world. Um, pretty amazing. Lots of stuff happening in Europe. In Europe. Um, Impressive. You're, you're welcome, Jethro. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's all because of you. So way to go. Um, Those are all my in, neighbors. Zoom in. Jethro. Zoom into that. I want to see that a little bit closer. Italy, Spain, France. There we wow, go. all over the place. Yep. Ireland, England. Very cool. Yep. Pretty awesome, huh? I mean, isn't yeah. that cool? Very cool. That's that's it's amazing. All the world. Yeah. Yeah. So it used to be when my dad was living in Brazil, um, he was down here. He was like the only one down there because he'd he'd watch this stuff occasionally. Um, but he actually told me. <laughs> He started listening to it one time, and it was so boring. He just couldn't keep watching. Ooh. But, um, yeah, but that's all Thanks, right. Thanks, Pops. That's, I know. That's way, way to go, Dad. Um, who's, not, who's not getting the holiday card this year? <laughs> <laughs> so we're even over in Africa, in China, yeah, Japan. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. So pretty exciting. I'm just grateful. Just so grateful. Is this the only one of its kind? Uh, as far as doing this, you're streaming this rather than, you know, educators coming to a location for a conference. So as far as I know, this is the only thing of its kind where we're focused on leadership type yeah. activities. I know there are some other uh, online type summits for some education things, but um, I'm pretty sure this is the, the longest running one. It's our third year. And, um, you know, I, I think it's the biggest um yeah so you know like you awesome. said we've, we've done it for three years and uh the other thing I, i'm aware of other online summits you know because for uh teams that that can't pay for the hotel the flight uh food all that kind of stuff it's a very attractive option but but most people that i know they have established conferences and then do this they ask you to pay first right mm -hmm. for participating right. before engaging with your team that that's a uh, that's against our principles and we want to invite we want to throw just a really huge party have incredible people you know get a lot out of this uh summit and then if they choose right there is an option uh to get the all access pass a little shout out a little plug the price goes up tomorrow but mm -hmm. attending right for the past two weeks completely free those videos that get dropped, you have them uh, for two days that you can enjoy them. But if you do want to invest, you want to replay, you want to share them with your team and that kind of thing. Or maybe you're like, you know, us, we're all podcast nerds here. 
and we love listening to uh, uplifting, encouraging professional development in the car on our commutes to work, you can get all the audio from the summit too with all access pass. But it's free. It's free to attend. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And um, and so the other part of that is that. Um, the all access pass, unlike a regular conference where you go and hear the sessions and, and can only rely on your notes with the all access pass, you get to have that all throughout the year. Um, you get to play that for your staff at different faculty meetings. I had one person who got the all access pass and I asked her how it was going and she said, well, I'm on the one per week plan. So what I do is every week, that's my own little Very professional cool. development. Nice. I watch one of the videos and then I'm going to do that all throughout the week, all throughout the year. So that's a whole year's worth of content for you right there so what anyway, i like I about that personalized that, learning, go ahead. Right? Personalized that's right learning for the educator and the administrator that's yep. so good exactly. what, what i like about the uh, testimony you shared there too it, there's a plan right so it, it's not you know overwhelming so if you one per week you can definitely do that and it gives you focus it gives you time to to actually execute apply implement ideas that you hear so I really appreciate uh, whoever shared that with you. Yeah, it was in an email. I can't remember who it was now. I'll try to find it and give a little shout out in a minute. <laughs> but okay. um, I do want to introduce our special guest today, Robin yes. Bagley. Um, if we didn't do that yet, but I figure now's a good time to introduce her. Uh, Robin has been a huge advocate for choice in education in the state of Utah for many, many years. She's been a principal of a charter school and was even uh, a running mate for a lieutenant governor. Is that right? Yes. One of my many crazy adventures. <laughs> yeah, The last election cycle, I ran with Jonathan Johnson, who was the president and CEO of Overstock.com for a while. Whoa. Yeah. Very cool. So Robin has a vast uh, history and experience and um, has been a, a good personal mentor to me. Just before I moved to Alaska, I was looking at uh, starting a charter school and I called her for advice and she helped me work through that process. And I went through the process of creating the charter school application and then decided to move to Alaska instead. But let me just tell you, Robin, just so that you're very aware um, I am now building that school and designing yeah. and researching that school up here in Fairbanks. And so I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying building because I'm not supposed to say that we're actually doing it yet because we're still researching, but we're making it a K-12 magnet school. That is a uh, public school that's going to be uh, focused on competency-based learning and blended learning and, um, and also reflect the diversity of our school district. And so instead of it being a white flight uh, kind of school where everybody leaves the poor schools to go to this fancy new uh, magnet school, it's going to invite everybody and it's really exciting. So <laughs> all that, You've all that work is out. My expectations, Jethro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Anything else that you'd like to say about yourself um, from that pretty weak introduction I gave? No, I think you've covered it. I'm very passionate about providing kids with the best education possible. So discussing all the different ways we can do that is, is what I like to do. Yeah. And so part of the uh, idea for, for the Transformative Leadership Summit to be about empowerment is after I talked with um, Robin on my podcast, Transformative Principle, um, we talked a lot about uh, empowerment. And so uh, that was part of where the idea for having our theme this year come from. So mm -hmm. uh, it's fitting that Robin is here today. So Robin, thank you so much. Um, so we do have a Q&A to get started. Uh, Danny, do you want to lead us in that? Yeah, we had a question come in uh, that I think is pretty interesting. So I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts. But uh, the person asked, and this is an anonymous uh, so we can't give a shout out, but how do you change the mindset of a very negative and culturally dangerous grade level of teachers, the toxic grade level of teachers? How do you approach that? Robin, you want to take a stab first? Sure, I'll take a stab. You know, the first thing is that you, you're transforming your school culture completely. Mm. And so you're not going to look traditional anymore. Your practices and the way that you communicate with your faculty and staff becomes important. 
And so as you do that and you start to have a group think and a collaborative effort, you're bringing your teachers together differently than maybe you used to. You know, Jethro and I talked about this before, that one of the things that a leader can do is, is change the way they're communicating with their teachers, whether that's meeting once a week and starting to talk about personalizing education for students and what are the ideas of how we could do that and get the juices flowing. So as you change the culture, hopefully you can bring those teachers along. So you can team them up with mentors, other teachers, mm -hmm. but bring them together collaboratively and just change the way you approach education. Um, also putting together at our school, I think it's important that um, personalized learning also is put into play for the educators. And part of their performance um, evaluations and structure is really about identifying their shortcomings and then putting plans in place for their own personalized learning to improve upon those areas. So as a leader, if you start to incorporate those things and you basically start to have these one-on-ones with your educators, put plans together, uh, open their eyes to how they can improve and change and put goals in place. It's just a step-by-step -step thing. But if you're thinking in terms of, you know, we're, we're flipping the school and we're turning it into something different, well, everything's going to be different. And those different elements that you incorporate are the ways that you can bring those tough teachers along. Hmm. All right. I, I guess I'll go next. So I... I like to think of this as the um, the negative and toxic culture issue is really something that nobody tries to be that way, but they've been allowed to be that way. And so that's just become the culture that's been okay, that's been appropriate and and has been allowed for however long that's been allowed. That's either your fault as the leader or that's somebody else's fault um, who was before you and you're new those are tough situations to deal with. And what I have found successful is to be able to go into a situation like that and not be so like, you guys are in trouble, but just say, how are things going? What do you guys need help with? And by the way, this behavior, it's not okay. And you're not in trouble. I'm not coming down on you. I'm not busting your chops. I'm just telling you what you're doing here with this negativity it's not okay. And that's not always comfortable or easy, but that's also something that as the leader, you got to be able to deal with that and, and take care of that. And, you know, just that little piece of talking with them and identifying the behavior and saying, that's not okay. That is a good place to start. This question reminds me of uh, the text switch by the Heath bros, you know, Chip and Dan and, I think my key takeaway, I've talked about this a million times on the podcast, but something that really struck a chord with me is that often we see resistance uh, as like, I, I don't like this plan. I don't like you as a leader. I don't like this place where I'm working or whatever. And, and a lot of times it's just, it's indicative of a, a, a lack of understanding, uh, a, a need for training, which I think Robin was talking about a little bit. Uh, and, and also, um, maybe just understanding too where you're going as an organization, that vision type stuff, right? Uh, and there might be fear, like, oh, you know, this is going to ask me to do different things uh, as an educator, and so I'm scared that I'm not going to be good at it or a highly effective teacher or whatever. So I, I think, you know, you need to be curious, ask yourself some questions, but, you know, what, what are the potential fears that my people may have or, or ask them? Is there something that you're afraid about with this? You know, why? Why does this new initiative program, et cetera, um, frustrate you, bother you? You know, I'm sensing some resistance. Am I, am I on with that? Am I off? Am I reading it wrong? Help me understand, right? So just be curious. Ask a lot of questions and have a good dialogue there. Uh, but I think a, a, a big thing and a, a yeah, question that every leader needs to ask is, yeah, well, how have I prepared my people for success? How have I trained them, developed them? Because a lot of times we'll just, we'll put out that plan and we've been working on it for months or years or whatever, and it all makes sense. And then you show it to somebody who it might be their, their first time seeing it, and then they drag their feet and they're not, you know, singing your praises and applauding for you and all that, and you take it personal. So I'd, I'd, look, I'd look within first. 
after providing adequate training and multiple opportunities for people to be successful and that kind of stuff, don't forget that, you know, uh, you can move people around, right? So if it's just, because the interesting thing with this one question was they said a grade level. They didn't say a building, right? So what's specific? That's something I'm curious about. What's specific? Let's say sixth grade. I love middle school. So those sixth grade, darn sixth grade teachers, why is it that well, Jethro, the purple cup, but you know what I mean? What's with them? What's going on there? Uh, and do I need to move some people, shift them around, maybe help them find a better place, et cetera, because it, it could be, it could be specific to just that grade level. Well, I think what Danny said as well is, um, you know, iteration and understanding iteration with a mission and vision is important. When we take when we set out on these ventures, you know, we've always looked at school as a has this stagnant constant thing where there's not a lot of change and and with the new methods of teaching, personalizing, learning, blended, etc., we're looking at it with new eyes and I think a key takeaway is iteration. In fact, setting a theme yearly for your staff um, my last year as the principal of Career Path High, our, our theme was iteration. Understanding that we haven't figured it out. We're never going to completely figure it out and say we've re reached perfection. If your teachers understand this and you're talking, you're addressing that fear that Danny talked about, a lot of them think, I just can't do this. Well, none of us are doing it perfect at the moment and probably ever. We're all working as a team to figure out where our shortcomings and gaps are. We're helping one another. Some people are further along than others, but it's a team effort and we need to accept that we're constantly iterating and changing. And we always will be. Just finding new ways to meet the needs of those students and to do our job the best that we can. Yeah, that is so true. Iteration is key and you're never, you've never arrived. I mean, even everything that we do, we always are our harshest critics and we can find ways that we could have done something better, you know, you, a teacher finishes giving a lesson and the kids are like, wow, that was amazing. And the teacher was like, I could have done this seven different ways and done it better than how I did it. We're just critical of ourselves. And it's easy for that criticism of ourselves to bring us down. And then when you start talking about those things, then you have a, a recurring theme, a self-fulfilling prophecy that you just become negative and more negative. And so with my assistant principals that I've had, we've had a rule where we don't talk negatively about our leaders because that creates a toxic culture in us. And so we don't vent to each other. We don't complain. We don't talk badly about our leaders because that doesn't help us move forward in the work. And so at the very beginning, we just establish that and then we go on from there. And so then once we've established that at the beginning, then we can say to each other when we start venting, okay, that's venting, that's complaining. What's your solution? What's your focus? How are you going to make it better rather than just complaining about it all the time? And I've found that that has been just awesome for our relationship with each other and for our relationship with our, with our supervisors. Many teachers have been an island as well, right? In, the, in a traditional system. And so now you're bringing them together and they, gaining that understanding that teamwork is better than isolation it's just getting over some of those bumps. Absolutely. Well, Robin, I'd like to change the subject and start focusing on you and your experience. And you, like I said before, have done a lot of work with getting parents involved in their children's education. So can you talk a little bit about some of the um, things that you do to help engage parents and also specifically with issues where we don't have, um, uh, what's the word, real avenues for choice in education in their school or district. How do you help teachers or parents become more involved in that process? Right, and that is, that's so important. I think if you talk to a lot of parents, they would tell you that they feel like they're the odd man out, that they never really know what's going on, they're the last to discover what's happening. And so you can change some simple practices. And the first thing is mindset. You need to understand that the parent is the third leg of the stool and they really are a partner in their child's education. And so talk about that from the beginning. So that's where I would start. It's important to have um, good onboarding 
and orientation at the beginning of the year. And I don't care if it's a repeat parent or a brand new parent. You need to have a practice where you're bringing the parents in. You can bring all the parents in with the students. You can bring them by grade level, by class level, however you want to do it. But have an orientation and an onboarding where you spell out all the key and critical things that they need to know. Like, you know, how does our curriculum work? Is it digital? Um, you know, what are the policies and procedures? I know I can find them online, but sometimes if the uh, faculty and the administration break them down for me while I'm right there so that I can ask questions, it's really helpful. Telling me how you're going to engage me as a parent right at that orientation and onboarding. What kind of communication can I expect? And how does this work? And so that's number one. Well, I would say number one is as a school culture, everyone understands the parent is the third leg of the stool. Number two is onboarding and orientation. And then from there, create something within your school. So maybe you don't have the ability to have a lot of choice and options with your district or your school, but what you can do is figure out how you're going to personalized learning for the students, starting with a mentor or a, in, in terms that we used at my school, it was the success coach. And you and I have talked about this a little bit, Jethro, but if you establish something like this for your students, it's going to go a long way. And we could go down a whole path on success coaches, but because we're keeping this focus right now on empowering parents, that's a wonderful way to empower parents. So a success coach assigned to your student can then become the liaison and the key communicator back and forth to parents. So we were a blended learning model. We had digital curriculum. And what happened is we always collaborated as a team and everyone knew what was going on with the student, but we, the blended, the blended, the blended was our model. The success coach was the one that became the key communicator if things were falling apart in the student's progress. So there was regular established communication in our policies and our parents knew about this. Um, it wasn't just when the student was struggling, there was a regular communication every week because the students met with their success coach once a week. So you got a report back, whether it was a quick email, maybe it was a phone call, text, you get to learn the parents and how they like to communicate. And so that constant back and forth. And then when the students, you know, Falling off, falling off the train and getting way behind their special meetings, the success coach is organizing those and bringing them together, inviting necessary teachers. So that's one way. The other way is to help your teachers understand that there needs to be good and strong open communication with parents. So don't reach out to a parent when their student is completely failing English. You need to start reaching out earlier. And we had we had methods, so I, I don't want to get too deep into how our methods work between success coach and teacher, but they both knew their roles about when they reached out to the parent. Specific policies for when the success coach reached out, specific policies for the teacher, and frankly, I never put any restrictions on the teacher. Reach out as often as you want, but what I did do is say, never let it get to this point before you reach out. So uh, again, it's coming back to, I would say number three is communication, communication, communication. And so I'm just sharing a little bit on how that could work, having a success coach, making sure the teachers understand when to communicate, and then administration. As an administration, we communicated regularly. We had newsletters. And what you find out is that people don't always read the first or the second time. So we started early messaging important things. And so every week that newsletter would go out, but if there was something that came up suddenly or something important off the cycle, certainly we would send out more communication. And then I also communicated as an administrator to um, when our students reach certain levels of struggling or getting behind, then I also reached out and had meetings with parents and your counselor knew their place. And you know, we could go on and on about communication, but look at it through different eyes than the traditional school. Um, on your personal touch as an administrator, the personal touch of the teachers, the personal touch of the counselor, on how often they're gonna reach out and really keeping them informed. And then a fourth one maybe isn't possible for everyone, but I'll bring it up. And that is if you are transitioning to digital curriculum and you're a blended model or an online model, 
or a partial, you know, partial digital curriculum, but there's a lot of face-to-face -face instruction as well. Making sure, if possible, that your parents have access to that digital curriculum dashboard. So at our school, we were blended fully digital curriculum and there was a parent portal. So parents could see everything their students were doing. So maybe you don't have a lot of different choice and options, but your kids are using digital curriculum. Make sure your platform allows the parents in. And so they could never obviously touch what the students were doing, but they could see where they were in their assignment. They could see scores on tests and assignments. And uh, they never felt like they were lost in where their student was. And part of that is, again, going back to the onboarding and the orientation, a lot of really good training on how to use that platform, how simple it is. You know, in our case, they could jump in on their cell phone and see, they could check anytime, anywhere. And instead of asking your student, well, how are you doing in class? How did you do on that last test? Did you finish your assignment? All of these questions become answered because they have a parent portal. So those are, those are four things. And then, you know, Jethro, tell me with your audience, what other types of things would you like to address and find out on how you can empower parents? Yeah, so, you know, I'd really like to go in a little bit more to the onboarding process because that's a thing that, um, that we often overlook uh, onboarding with our staff as well as our parents. So I wanna talk specifically about the onboarding the parents. You gave a lot of really great ideas and suggestions um, in there that I think everybody should definitely be looking at. I just want to talk about one of those from my own perspective this year, which was I did a weekly newsletter, which after interviewing Will Parker last year, um, he talked about the importance of open communication with parents. And so every single week I emailed um, the parents and I missed a couple, but it was a lot better than once per month or, or even less than that as it was before. And what I found was that even if people weren't reading the emails, they knew that they were coming and they saw my name. So when I would meet people throughout the year, people would say, oh, I keep getting emails from you. And I'm like, great, how do you like them? Are you reading them? No, I never read them, but <laughs> I, I at least am getting them. And and so then they they knew that I was open to communication. So they had something to talk to me about when they met me which I think was just really beneficial for my students and for the parents and for me that we knew that door of communication was open when it need when we needed to it was it was there and I I felt like that was uh, that was challenging for me to do that every single week but it was very powerful and I think helped a lot so let's let's talk a little bit about onboarding um parents and when you say onboarding, not everybody in education understands what that means. So first define what onboarding is and then talk about, um, you know, most schools have an open house and that's really where people come and they check out the school. And that's usually just like a, hi, how are you kind of a thing. And there's not always a method to that madness. So define empowerment and then talk about how you could use a traditional open house for onboarding. Okay. So onboarding really is just tutorials on how the school is going to work, what the policies and procedures are, how we're going to engage your student, what we're going to do when your student falls off track, all of the really important things that help them to be the partner in education. So if you have digital curriculum explaining how it works, giving them training for their portal, again, the policies and procedures or how their success coach will work, what kind of activities we have, you know, what, what is the, uh, the theme of your school, like setting the culture, that's an opportunity to do that. All of these things, it really just becomes a tutorial on what you identify as the most important things to share with parents. And you need to sit back and say to yourself, what are the critical things that will help these parents to be the third leg of the stool? What do I really want them to know that is going to help their student be successful? and then organize it and put it together. We, we have fun with it. Um, we engage faculty members as part of it and the counselor. And the other aspect to it is you can never force a parent to be there, but we really do say it's required. And we break it down depending on the size of your school. We broke it down by grade level, but you could do it any way that you wanted that facilitated it the best. You can't have too large of a crowd there. 
because it's going to be difficult and you want to have buy-in and so you really make it this is mandatory we really need you there we want you on our team um, we're going to help you make your students successful by coming and so paint the picture for them and then and have um, that strong onboarding meeting together and make it a, a time that you lift the culture elevate the culture teach them about the culture of the expectations and how you're working together so those are the ways that i i we have done it and it's been very successful yeah i i think that's great um we have a new buzzer system coming to our school where people have to buzz in when they come to the school during the day and so my plan for that is to create a uh video teaching them how to do that putting it on facebook because we've got yeah. a lot of parents who like that and then also sending that out in the newsletter as well so that's that's one thing that we'll be doing to get the word out that's a great idea give multiple avenues you could even record your onboarding and then post it online um, and like you said specific things tutorials on how to access their curriculum or their portal or how to use this uh, buzzing in system that you've got for your school or on anything. And you can have your teachers help with that. Those who are savvy and enjoy that, like, you know, if you have a success coach role, you could have a tutorial on that. However, you could make it more accessible and change and shift the paradigm and the mindset of how a school works, how you're a partner. We want to include you. We want to give you all the information at your fingertips. We want you there. We have open door policies. I mean, clearly you're going to have the first, first lines of communication. What are you struggling with? Well, this is who you talk to first, the teacher, the counselor, the success coach, the administrator, but, but never make them feel like you're blocking them from getting to whom they want to talk to make them understand that you're going to direct them to the best person to help them and from there it will move possibly to different people and so you know i think a lot of parents feel um that they're placated or um, pandered to and that nobody wants to talk to them and it, it's just it's so hard to get in and be a part of your child's education and also we've been conditioned so that's a challenge that you face right i would say i i'm a parent of four children and they're all graduated now my baby just graduated this year and so i understand congratulations very, thank you i yes. understand very well of how we've been conditioned to kind of stay out right we'll take them drop them off they're with us we'll handle things we'll communicate with you if necessary but just let us do our job and you feel like you're not a part of it you feel lost why did I just find out all of a sudden that my child's spelling two classes? They didn't have that last credit they needed for graduation. I'm finding this out at the last minute. What's going on? So making as much information accessible to them and also helping them understand you want to hear from them. We're going to talk to you. You're welcome. You know, let's work together and shifting that mindset from being conditioned to stay out of it to we want you right in it. Love that. So, um, Robin, we had a we had a question come through Facebook. Uh, do you have time for one more? Sure. Cool. So this one's from Joel Jethro. Is this the Joel that I interviewed? That Joel? This is the Joel. Yeah. What? So somebody who was in the TLS asking a question too. I love that. Thanks for the question, Joel. Uh, but he wants to know how do you build parent leadership and voice among the quieter or busier parents in the school? Online is good, but what do you do to draw them in the building? So reaching out a lot really starts to change it. Um, you know, quick anecdotal story is that when we started our school, we had a lot of communication and we heard from some parents who would say, seriously, stop bugging me. <laughs> I have calls from teachers, I have texts, I have emails, you know, this is inundation. And we would say, we are so glad you feel inundated. We're not going to apologize for it. It's how we operate and it won't stop. But my, I share this story because my point is, as they start to see a change in communication and reaching out, then it changes things. And honestly, um, my staff, my faculty and the success coaches would start to make phone calls to those teachers 
and just chat with them about anything about their student, not bad things, just calling to say, hey, this is so great about your kid. This is something they do when, we're, when they're learning or on their assignments and it's so fun. I thought you would just like to know this about your child and start to build those bridges. And then my, parent, my success coaches did personal calls to the parents as well to get them to um, our parent nights which didn't look like parent-teacher conference. They made appointments. So you knew that you were gonna get your time and you just had to show up at your time. But they reached out to them personally to schedule that and say, what will work for you? Lots of invites when we have uh, something going on with the students where we're highlighting students in an assembly or whatever it is. And lots of personal outreach, which they've never had before, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I never had any personal outreach like that while my kids were in school. So as you start to uh, bridge those gaps and divides and you do that outreach, it really worked with getting the parents out. Just I like the yeah, personalization I, piece. And, you know, something else too, though, is uh, people may agree or disagree with inundating with the communication style. But the, the point is, uh, it reminds me of Pat Lencioni's view of core values. And it's, it was so important to you, like a great core value you're willing to do it better than anybody else and at the risk of getting punished for it, right? You might upset some people or they might not understand it right away. And so it acts as a magnet attracting those to you that you want to work with and repels the others. Uh, but that's a really interesting point. Right. And find great ways to uh, reward the students and recognize the students. And then you mm. pull parents in more as well. We had next-gen leaders every month that we recognize. We had a lot of different things. And so opportunity to bring the parents to the campus for those, those things, those celebrations. Yeah, very, very awesome. Well, Robin, thank you so much for, um, for being here today and for sharing your wisdom and experience. You've done thank you. so much. And I'm just so grateful to be able to learn from you yet again. So... Well, thank, Again, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. You know that I always think it's fun to chat with you. I love what you're doing. So anytime, and I hope what I shared will be helpful to your leaders. Thank you. Thank you. And so you're welcome to stay on or you're welcome to bail. Either one you want is fine, Robin. Not you who are watching, but you, Robin, you're welcome to. Um, I do want to just close up by saying the Transformative Leadership Summit All Access Pass you can get that. I just put a link in the Facebook video so you can check that out. Um, and also, I want to thank our sponsors for uh, this whole entire um, summit, uh, Zoom, which is what we're using right now to do this live uh, Q&A and webinar. Um, so Zoom, Mastery Track, Can Do You, Mindsteps Inc. and The Learning Loop. And of course, a huge, huge thank you to Mind Rocket Media and Ed Circuit for uh, doing so much promotion and um, talking about it and getting the word out there for this amazing thing. Um, we had over 3,000 people join us uh, for this free online conference. I mean, how amazing is that? It's just, <laughs> it blows my mind. So, um, so thank you to everybody who's come, who's been part of this. It's been truly amazing. And um uh, as Danny and I have mentioned, we've just got more great stuff in store in the future. So we're grateful for everybody who's participated. Any final closing words, Danny? It's just been a blast. You know, I love partnering and collaborating with you and getting to talk to awesome leaders like Robin, uh, share their story and unpack a bit of what makes them special. So, uh, but all of this isn't possible unless we have people show up, right? Like if we could put this on, but if nobody comes, what's the point? So for all the fearless, you know, educators and leaders that uh, engage in the Transform Leadership Summit, I um, just want to say, you know, very much thank you to you. Uh, we're super grateful that you listen to our podcast, that you attend this event, and that you're a big support. Yep. All right. So that is a wrap for this today. There's a bunch of videos to watch today about teacher empowerment. Um, so make sure that you go check those out. And that's it. Transformative Leadership Summit. Dot com. Thanks so much and everybody have a wonderful day.